Despite the excitement of these flights and all of the heavy work schedule that the astronauts have aboard, uh, they do have to eat and they do have to sleep. And while we're waiting for further transmissions of interest from the spacecraft, and right now they're busy uh, with technical data, if they begin to describe what they saw again, we'll come right back, of course. But meanwhile, Nelson Benton and Scott McLeod at Grumman Aircraft can perhaps tell us something about the meal time, which will come shortly for the astronauts. Uh, Walter, we, uh, with our own uh, mock-up flight plan, Scott McLeod is the cook on this flight, and uh, we're using a few non-space rated items, but the food is uh, rated for space, and we have sort of bypassed the main course. We're going on to dessert, which is chocolate pudding. Scott, you take it from there, because uh, you're the chef. Oh, oh very well. Oh, this is the water gun that's used, Walter. This is what they'll be carrying in the spacecraft. This although you wouldn't believe it, is chocolate pudding in this pouch. And the technique that's followed is that the top is cut off of the envelope that holds the chocolate pudding. The gun is then inserted in the top. And I'm afraid I'll squirt Nelson if I squirt it here. <laughs> okay, but the proper it. amount for the pudding would be about four ounces of water. I'll give it a try. <laughs> that's what I thought. Back to you, Walter. <laughs> you know, you know. I remember I did that once on Mercury. Some um, people still write me about it every once in a while. During the Mercury program, I tried to play with some space food. I couldn't get the packages open or any part of it done, and I was in bare hands, not in gloves. I don't know how they manage in space. They're doing better, of course, all the time, and I think that... Uh, Arthur Clark can sort of confirm this for me, as more that we're out in space, the more men become acclimated, if they ever can, to space flight, the more we find that some of the bugaboos disappear in space. And for instance, food. They thought they were always going to have to go for the little bite-sized pieces so that the bits wouldn't fly around. And because of the lack of gravity, they'd have to eat out of those tubes. Uh, they, they wouldn't be able to handle a fork or a spoon. And now they found that, uh, that there's just enough uh, uh, kind of, uh, I don't know what it is, residual gravity or something, I don't know what you'd call it, but they, they put the food in aspic now, and now they're having one meal a day with a spoon. But if you have the food sticky so that it's, it coheres and then the bits, the crumbs don't drift away, then you can handle it even in zero gravity. But of course, when we start commercial space flight, we will, we will have gravity on our uh, spacecraft because we'll set them spinning. So we'll produce enough centrifugal force so things will stay in the same place. And then we've got to drink from glasses perfectly normally. And, uh, and according to that uh, movie you wrote, 2001, we'll have little uh, treads on our shoes so that uh, we stay yeah. firmly on the platform at all times. Uh, well, I, I hope it will be that way, and I hope it comes quickly enough for me to enjoy it. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 10 will continue in a moment. Certainly one of the great exciting moments of the space program uh, has just been reported from uh, out there around the moon as Tom Stafford and Eugene Cernan swooped within 10 miles of the moon's surface. And although the communication was not too good, reported back the, in great excitement quite clearly what they were seeing uh, as they passed over the moon. They're now on the way out in their second pass around the moon. We'll drop to within 11 miles of the moon's surface on this next pass, and we'll be back on the air at 7 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time to report it. This is Walter Cronkite at CBS News Space Center. This has been a CBS News special report, The Flight of Apollo 10, brought to you by Western Electric, manufacturing and supply unit of the Bell System, as part of our continuing coverage of important news events. Next Apollo update on the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. This is CBS. This is a CBS News special report, The Flight of Apollo 10. Brought to you by Western Electric, manufacturing and supply unit of the Bell System, as part of our continuing coverage of important news events. 
Reporting from the CBS News Apollo headquarters in New York, correspondent Walter Cronkite. Good evening. The flight of Apollo 10 is going exceedingly well. Although we haven't heard from the spacecraft now for uh, 35 minutes or so, they're on the 14th revolution of the moon. The two of them, the lunar module called Snoopy, the command module called Charlie Brown. They're back behind the moon and there is no communication with Earth. It'll be another 10 minutes before we get another signal from them. Uh, at this point, the uh, lunar module should be out at the high point of its uh, orbit around the moon, its second into Independent orbit of the moon away from Charlie Brown out about 227 miles and it would be plunging now just about down toward the moon surface again. It will be on that uh, downward path as they come around on the right side of the moon as we look at it from here on Earth, come around to the near side of the moon and uh, establish communications again 10 minutes from now. They'll come down this time to about 13 miles. It looks like their orbit is now 13 and a half perhaps miles over that the landing site uh, about midpoint in the moon as we look at it right on the equator uh, then they will at that point at uh, at uh, 47 minutes after the hours 33 minutes after the hour 733 about uh, 31 minutes from now they will separate uh, from the descent stage of their lunar module and begin the uh, tricky maneuver of climbing back to 69 mile altitude and rejoining the command module uh, called Charlie Brown where uh, John Young awaits them. That uh, separation involves this. They fire first time in the hole as it's called from the uh, descent stage. That's never been done before. It wasn't done on uh, the Apollo 9 uh, flight. And down there, just 11 miles from the moon, they will fire off, leaving this descent stage behind and uh, with their engine with the ascent stage, come back to 69 mile altitude and rejoin the command module. The maneuver begins at 7.33 Eastern Daylight Time from now, and it's now 7.03 Eastern Daylight Time, and it will be uh, after 10 o'clock tonight before that maneuver is completed. They will begin the terminal phase of the maneuver at 9 minutes after 10 tonight. The rendezvous should come at 10.54, and the docking about uh, 19 minutes after 11. The flight has gone exceedingly well today, but there have been some heart-stopping moments uh, right after early this morning, around oh, 11 o'clock uh, this morning after Cernan and Tom Stafford had climbed into the lunar module. They had a little trouble getting their communications going, but then that was all cleared up. It was only temporary. A little later on today, uh, an hour after that time, uh, when they began testing their spacecraft before separation, they found that they could not depressurize the three-foot tunnel between the lunar module and the command module, and that proved to be a very very serious concern and worry because without the depressurization of that tunnel it meant that uh, there was added friction set up between the two spacecraft and the possibility of damage to the docking rings absolutely necessary for their redocking tonight uh, so Houston looked very carefully at that problem as did the astronauts themselves considerable concern about it until they decided that they could go ahead and undock anyway. However, that decision was really left to the astronauts. They were given some uh, parameters beyond which they could not go, some constraints. Uh, uh, they had to watch very carefully as to whether there was too much of the movement between the two spacecraft that might damage those rings. When they decided there wasn't, they made the decision themselves on the far side of the moon and separated. And then the first firing of the lunar module's descent stage engine, and that went exactly uh, on time to bring them down within 10 miles of the moon surface uh, revolution ago. Then Stafford and Cernan very excitedly called up the sites they were seeing. The communications were not too good, and we heard that both of their cameras aboard failed. How many pictures they got before that happened, we don't know. But at any rate, uh, perhaps they got some pictures for us, and we got some voice description of the amazing sights they were seeing. The most important thing, the landing radar, which will have to work for the Apollo 11 spacecraft so that it can set down on the moon's surface, worked apparently exceedingly well. It gave uh, precise readouts to Stafford and Cernan as to their position over the moon. And furthermore, by eyeballing it, as pilots say, by 
uh, looking at the site, they said they saw no problem for the moon landing. They said it looked even smoother than they expected, although the terrain around there was apparently uh, pretty sensational for them. As a matter of fact, Tom Stafford said that he saw enough boulders to fill all of Galveston Bay. And the first word from John Young, uh, flying overhead 69 miles high in the command module, uh, reporting back to Earth, was it the first words from Stafford and Cernan? Well, he said, they're mumbling down there about all the boulders. They've been going through a, uh, a short period here of uh, getting a bite to eat, presumably, aboard the spacecraft as we wait for them to acquire signal again, coming around this side of the moon. That comes in another five minutes now. And we might go back out to Grumman Aircraft in Bethpage, Long Island, where the, they build this lunar module. Nelson Benton and Scott McLeod are there, and they can tell us something about mealtime, since we're all enjoying it just about now. Walter, um as we reported earlier, we were preparing uh, the dessert. We had a little bit of trouble uh, injecting the water into this space bag that has the chocolate pudding in it, but we've overcome that problem. And uh, the chocolate pudding is ready. You use sort of a toothpaste tube mode to eat it. And it comes to the top, and uh, it tastes like chocolate pudding. Scott, there's something else on this. Uh, this bag, too, a big pill on the top. Is is that a pill, or j just what is it? Well, Nelson, that's not a bicarb. What you do with this pill is when you've finished eating the food, then you take the pill out, break it in half, and insert it back through this tube. And it's obviously what, what you. Purpose? Well, you can't roll the window down and throw the bag out, so you must keep this food in the capsule, and it will begin to smell after a while, and this kills the bacteria. It's inside sort of, it. Sort of a matter of uh, space dishwashing, I suppose. Well, I guess so, yes. Well, Walter, the eat period for Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan is just about over now, and uh, they'll be approaching the very critical stage of the flight, the rendezvous with Charlie Brown up above them on a full stomach. Well, we've been through many of the critical points of this flight now. We got uh, off of the Earth's surface on last uh, Sunday afternoon. We got into the uh, translunar trajectory in good shape, got into the lunar orbit. We've had the first firing of the descent stage of the uh, lunar module. The separation went well, and now we have the important function of getting back to the command module. This is critical because, of course, the lunar module cannot return to Earth safely on its own. It could probably get back into a trans-Earth trajectory, but, to trajectory, but it uh, could not enter the Earth's atmosphere. It is not protected by a heat shield. It would, uh, is not meant to fly in the space atmosphere, and it could not fly. So the uh, lunar module has to rejoin the command module tonight, and they've got one more of those close passes over the moon's surface. However, that has now been accomplished once, and some of the fear and the danger uh, regarding such a close passage has uh, uh, now been dissipated. It has worked as uh, Houston and all of the space engineers and scientists were sure it would work. Uh, they were able to swoop within 10 miles of the moon's surface, not be uh, seriously affected, apparently, by by those mass concentrations of material under the moon's surface, which cause uh, some uh, deviations in the lunar gravity, and with some concern for uh, the pilots before they tested it this first time, the second sweep over the uh, moon at 13-mile uh, altitude should provide no problems. CBS News color coverage, the flight of Apollo 10, will continue in a moment. Critical maneuvers ahead of the Apollo 10 spacecraft, the lunar module and the command module, depend, of course, on the function of their engines. Bruce Morton at the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston has a report on those critical engines that the astronauts depend on in both the two modules. Bruce? Walter, there are three main engines. Uh, there's something like 47 in all, but most of them are just uh, the reaction control system thrusters. This is the big one by, uh, by the spacecraft's present standards, the service propulsion system engine. It's uh, the one Apollo 10 used for its mid-course correction on the way to the moon, the one it used to go into orbit about the moon. And uh, I'm sure most important now from the astronaut's point of view, it's the one that uh, they'll use to get TEI, trans-Earth injection, the start of their trip home. It can be fired as many as 36 times. It has 25, 20,500 pounds of thrust. 
It weighs about 800 pounds empty. I can verify that because we spent some time today trying to push this one around. Over next door to it is the one uh, we've been hearing the most about in the last hour or two, I would say. Uh, that's the uh, descent propulsion system monitor. The one Snoopy used as Gene Cernan and Tom Stafford swooped away from John Young in the command module and skimmed down to within 50,000 feet or so of the moon. It's also the engine which, uh, next time it's hoped, will land two astronauts on the moon. And still next to that, the one that has to take them off again, uh, we've lost your picture there, but uh, go ahead and tell us about the engine. We saw the earlier picture and know that you're now down to that small one at the end. Order the small one, uh, I'm really kind of fond there of There we are. You know, if you... Uh, oh, we see you again, Bruce. I'm, uh, I'm kind of fond of this little one. Uh, if you contrast this in your mind's eye with that giant Saturn rocket that uh, lifted Apollo 10 off the Earth, this is the ascent propulsion system. Now, the three stages of that Saturn uh, have something close to nine million pounds of thrust, as you know, Walter. This little fella has just about 3,500, and uh, on Apollo 11, it's got to do the whole job of lifting two astronauts off the surface of the moon. It's the engine which, uh, shortly now, Apollo 10 will be using in the final stages of that critical rendezvous maneuver. It doesn't really look uh, as if it had enough power to get from here to the corner drugstore, but uh, it works. The uh, theory about these things is that it's really difficult for them not to work. They've got uh, backup valves in case something goes wrong with the valves. And of course, uh, once the oxidizer and the fuel meet, it's really against all the laws of chemistry if they don't ignite. Walter? Yes, Bruce, uh, we just have had word from Mission Control that they have established contact with the command module coming around on uh, this revolution of the moon, uh, and they are just trying to establish contact with Snoopy now, who's a little bit behind the command module, sweeping down toward the moon's surface. We've got Mission Control punched in uh, to our system here, and you will hear the communications as soon as we do. Uh, Charlie Brown, uh, Houston, I cut you out at the beginning of the pass. Uh, say again, uh, what are you going to say, over? Nothing important. I'm about to lose. I just lost a uh, range that went to 320.50 miles. And I'm uh, no longer in voice contact with Snoopy. I think we're just flat out of range. Uh, Roger that. We copy. I can hear him very faintly in the background. Roger. It's 320 uh, nautical miles. Charlie Brown, Houston, uh, it's your computer. We're through with the load, over. 320 nautical miles from Snoopy. Roger, thank you. Almost the extreme range that he is scheduled to be in this uh, uh, pass and in the entire flight. The maximum, uh, this is, uh, comes up to 368 statute miles. The maximum will be 420 statute miles, uh, which will occur uh, in about uh, 10 minutes from now, about five minutes from now. And that will be their maximum range. From there on out, they will begin closing again. The command module considerably ahead of the, of the lunar module the further out you go in space, the higher you are in making the orbit of any given body, the slower you go uh, in comparison to land speed on that body, and in comparison to any... I'm just about to lose you there. I think that was the voice of John Stafford in Snoopy saying he's about to lose uh, Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown has already said that he thought he had lost uh, Snoopy as far as communications go. They're right at the extreme range. Hello, John. Do you read us? Just barely, you guys. Did you say? Simulation. We 
heard briefly from John Stafford, uh, Tom Stafford, reporting to uh, John Young. Hello, Charlie Brad, Snoopy, do you read? Roger, read your line clear now, or weak but clear. I read you guys. Hello, Houston, how do you read Snoopy? Roger, Snoopy, reading you 5 by over. Tom Stafford confirming right, that Houston. Yes, Charlie Brown, if he's still in track attitude, uh, I can't get the lock on at this distance out here, over. Uh, Roger, he had you at, he broke lock at 320 miles on the VHF. Uh, stand by, uh, we'll ask him on his attitude. Charlie Brown, Houston, are you still in uh, track and attitude for the... Charlie Brown, Houston, are you still... at attitude 180, which is where I'm Houston. Roger. Supposed to be right now. Roger, Charlie Brown, we copy. Uh, Snoop uh, Houston, uh, he is in uh, attitude as called for out in the uh, uh, flight plan, a 180 pitch. Uh, we got your asset looks good and your asset batteries look good. Over. This communications is a uh, rather uh, Just pressurize the major the test good. of the Roger, systems. Roger, if you'll give us uh, your computer, we need uh, uh, and uh, data, we have a state uh, for you. Of the, uh, of the systems uh, in this uh, uh, maneuver, they were curious as to how far they would have communications. It had been hoped that the VHF, uh, very high frequency communication link, uh, the voice link between the command module and the lunar module, uh, would uh, stretch out uh, all the way to the maximum that they would be separated. This is Houston. Uh, it has turned out to be... Houston, uh, we show you uh, loaded uh, TIG incorrectly in T-30. TIG is 102-55-0140. Over. It turns out that they uh, do not have voice communication uh, correction, uh, correction, uh, between the two spacecraft and this great distance. Uh, they have not had confirmation that they also have uh, radar contact at this distance, tracking contact. Uh, the, you heard uh, John Young in the command module say that he was in the proper attitude for that, but no confirmation that he was actually tracking the lunar module. ignition time if Charlie Brown has to perform the maneuver uh, in case Snoopy can't. And these uh, communications... Hey, uh, how does that look to you? Looks real fine, Charlie Brown. And these communications, of course, a lot of this is uh, technical communication, the read-up of computer settings. Uh, Houston, we got the load in. The computer's yours, over. And timelines for uh, future events. Uh, Roger. Thank you very much. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 10 will continue in a moment. And so both the uh, command module and the lunar module have made their 14th revolution around on the other side of the moon are now on this side of the moon. If we had uh, glasses strong enough, perhaps we could uh, see them passing across the moon. They've just come into sight and are right around the middle belt of the moon on the equator of the moon. Uh, with the lunar module uh, coming down, we now should be perhaps at a height of uh, perhaps around 100 miles, a little less than that as he gets down toward the 13 miles altitude which he will uh, have reached at 733 or uh, around uh, 14 minutes from now he uh, at that point uh, will separate from the uh, descent stage of his uh, spacecraft and then uh, shortly after that fire the ascent stage engine to come back and rendezvous later tonight with the command module the only communication we've had from them in the last couple of minutes was uh, Houston talking to uh, the uh, lunar module, Snoopy as it's called, uh, talking about the cameras aboard. Those cameras failed while they were on the first low pass uh, over the lunar landing site, which is a great disappointment to, to the men on the ground in Houston and to the entire space program. They expected to get some good close-up pictures of the landing site as seen by a spacecraft coming in toward it. One of the principal 
wonderful uh, objectives of this mission was indeed to get those pictures. And yet uh, these uh, men aboard the lunar module, Tom Stafford and Eugene Cernan, reported that uh, both they'd taken so many pictures, uh, both cameras had gone out on them. How many pictures they got before the cameras went out, uh, we do not know. They were just talking about the problem, and they suggested that uh, in one of their cameras, the still picture camera, uh, the battery seemed to have gone. In the other camera, there, was, uh, there were other problems uh, with the power supply, and uh, they're going to see if they can get them fixed up before they swoop down over the landing site for the second time. The importance of this flight so far has been that in that first uh, pass over the landing site, there seemed to be no reason why the Apollo 11 astronauts in July should not be able to go safely in to a landing. The spacecraft systems, the radar particularly, the landing radar worked well, and for everything that Stafford and Cernan could see, there are no uh, obstacles in the way. In fact, matter of fact, they said that the site looked even smoother than they had expected it to look. As we've been hearing, uh, Gene Sermon and Tom Stafford divide up the workload in that lunar module. Recently, David Schumacher talked with lunar mo module pilot Cernan, asked how the two men who fly the LEM divide up the work. You're basically divided in position by what you can reach in a LEM, Tom being on the left and myself being on the right. And we, although we have control systems on both sides of the spacecraft for redundancy, I use mine very sparingly uh, only because uh, I'm wrapped up in two computers. Tom is basically wrapped up in controlling the spacecraft and maneuvering the spacecraft to particular attitudes, maneuvering the spacecraft to acquire stars. Uh, I handle one computer exclusively on my side and share the load with the other computer in the center between us. Uh, these are guidance and navigation computers. Uh, we have to align our inertial platform, our gyros, if you want to call them that, to, uh, to the stars so that we know that we're pointing in the right direction at the right time. Well, this is basically my responsibility, but not without the coordination and teamwork of Tom actually flying the spacecraft while I'm marking on stars. So we're never really want running open loop independently. Uh, when I'm done with a computer, I'll say, hey, Tom, you've got it, and he'll take the computer and do something else that he has to do to maneuver the spacecraft while I'll take it and match it with my other computer for redundancy solutions. We're keeping uh, in touch with Manned Space Center. Uh, it's being piped right into us here, and if we hear any more interesting conversations with the spacecraft, of course, we'll punch right into them. Nelson Benton at the Grumman Aircraft uh, plant uh, talked with Dick Bassano out there. He's the chief consulting pilot to uh, Grumman and the man who trained Gene Cernan and Tom Stafford in the uh, lunar module. Nelson? Dick, in watching the television pictures from Apollo 10, the antics of Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan, we get the idea they're pretty extroverted. Is that uh, the experience you had with them in working on the LAM? Well, I, I think that uh, Gene Cernan is the more extrovert of the bunch. They're, they're uh, hard workers, of course, but they do enjoy their levi levity, as we all do. They're typical fighter pilots. So <laughs> when they get a chance to uh, joke a little bit, why, uh, they'll do it. Uh, they've done it in the chamber tests. Did they have any reservations about the, about the lunar module when they first looked at it, either of them? Well, uh, yeah, Gene... Not real reservations, they're, they're sort of uh, uh, discovery, I'd say, when uh, Gene first noted that the uh, descent stage uh, doesn't really have uh, the good, shiny outside skin, and you know, see most of the mylar. Uh, he had a few comments uh, to the effect that it looked like Reynolds wrap, uh, same as McDivitt had commented about it. Uh, I don't think he has any real reservations to fly it, however, it was just, uh, uh, he was in a jovial mood that day. How much time have they actually spent in, in the LEM that they will be flying? Well, actually, in LEM 4, the prime crew has only spent uh, about 20 to 25 hours in the actual vehicle. Most of their time is in the simulators, which are pretty high fidelity in it, uh, at any rate. You spent a lot more time in it than they have, but then that's the way things are designed. Yeah, we try to get the bugs out of it and, uh, before the customer gets the bird. Thank you very much. From Houston, uh, we are listening to them update uh, more material to the lunar module, uh, arranging for the staging, which uh, they say is scheduled now for about uh, seven minutes from this point. 
That's the point at which they leave the ascent stage behind. When they do, they lose an important source of power to the uh, space men. Uh, they're circling the moon. The ascent stage engine with up to 9,000 pounds of thrust uh, could be used to put the entire docked configuration, that is the command uh, module and the lunar modules, back into a trajectory toward the Earth. But once they leave it behind, they have uh, gotten rid of that one contingency in case of emergency, and they're left with only their service propulsion system engine in the command module with 20,500 pounds of thrust to put them into that Earth trajectory. As soon as we get any further descriptions from the lunar module, from Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan as they sweep down toward the Earth's surface, we'll be plugging into that, but we haven't uh, been hearing much yet. They're, uh, they're talking engineering right now. Uh, they're concerned with uh, getting everything lined up for the most critical maneuvers as far as Stafford and Cernan are concerned yet in this flight, and that's getting back to Charlie Brown, the command module, so they can come home. One of the important features of that rendezvous and docking is going to be being sure that that docking latch works and they can really hook up with the uh, uh, command module. And this was one of the concerns uh, before they separated today when they had a little trouble uh, with the uh, with purging the, uh, the oxygen uh, out of the, the pressure out of the uh, tunnel between them. Bill Stout and Leo Krupp out at North American Rockwell and Downey can tell us more about that. Walter, I think first of all we have to draw a line of distinction between capture latches and docking latches. Now, what we see here is the probe coming out the front of our command ship at North American Rockwell and Downey. And there are in the circle, the docking ring, 12 of these docking latches. And Leo has one that I think perhaps he can use to show us exactly what's involved in all this. Leo, what we're talking about here are the docking latches, the, the hard lock, in effect. That's right, Bill. These are the docking latches. We have 12 of these around the, the tunnel area. And when, when these are actuated, the two vehicles are rigidly attached and we're in what we call the hard docking configuration. Now, earlier today when Stafford and Cernan went into the lunar module, John Young cocked all of these docking latches. He retracted them, pulled them back in the cocked configuration as we see here so that when the lunar module comes back later this evening and docks, these will be in the right configuration to, be ready to, go. to receive the lunar module and to uh, rigidly attach it. You see this hook here comes over this flange here which is part of the lunar module docking ring. Now we can simulate the docking by throwing this lever here. Uh, we have to assume that the two vehicles have docked in a soft dock configuration where the probe and drogue are mated but the two docking rings are still 10 inches apart. Then John Young will retract the the probe which will pull the two vehicles together. Now as the lunar module docking ring comes down, which will be simulated by this little piece of uh, arm coming down. It will trip a lever, which will release the docking latch, which I'll do at this time. And you see this lock goes over through a spring mechanism, and the two vehicles are firmly attached. You now, can always, You can certainly hear that in the spacecraft when all 12 of those go at once, or, or fewer than 12, for that matter. It's a good loud noise and quite a jolt. That's right. Uh, John will have two cues when... Uh, the docking latches go. One will be the sound, which is quite loud when all 12 of these go at one time. The second is he has an annunciator on the instrument panel, which will go to gray, telling that at least six of these docking latches have made it. Now, all we really need are any three of these 120 degrees apart to make a uh, satisfactory docking. One third of the way around the circle. That's right. A minimum of three will hold them that tight. That's right. All we need are any three 120 apart. Now, one of the first things John will do after docking is remove the tunnel hatch and go up into the tunnel to see if all of these 12 latches have uh, automatically actuated. Now, in the event that one hasn't, he goes up in the tunnel and he finds one that's still in the cock configuration that hasn't automatically re released. He'll take his felt tip pen like I'm using here and trip this little lever which will manually trip it and allow the latch to make. So he will, one way or another, get all 12 of those latches made it up. But Leo, these are not the latches we talked about during the, the tension earlier today when we were talking about capture latches. Hmm? No, Bill, at that point in time, these 12 latches were in the cock configuration or un, unmated. 
And the only thing holding the vehicles together at that time with the probe and the capture latches, which are the three latches in the head of the probe, which extend through to the other side of the drogue. But these are the 12 we depend on, Walter, when they come back together later today, the 12 that will hold them firmly together for the return of Stafford and Cernan to the command ship and later to Earth. They've got just uh, one minute to go before the staging, before they drop that descent propulsion system engine. And they are coming now down to their low point, 13 miles above the moon's surface. But they're so busy with engineering details that they're not hearing much description of what, or any description of what they're seeing. But let's listen in. My attitude looks good. I'm coming up on 270 upside down. And yours is looking good. Getting confirmation of staging any moment here. Danny, next time you want to go. Animation shows the firing of the RCS thrusters. And we have a map is set for a light vehicle. We'll do it this way. Okay, you ready? Animation just ready? a little bit ahead of the reports from the spacecraft. Okay. Confirmation. We see staging. The telemetry report staging. This is Eugene Cernan. Getting a gimbal lock? Didn't, she didn't go, huh? Got stage. Now he says they've got staging. I understand that in Houston, Mission Control, they get uh, reports by telemetry. Yep, who's up, babe? Okay, our angle. You didn't lock, huh? Something's wrong with that guy. Okay, uh, roll is 180 and pitch is 233. 233. These reports from Cernan. I'm going to put my ball on inertial just to check them out and verify them, too. I can't reach it. These reports from Cernan. You can verify it on the ag. These are the reports from Cernan. Uh, Snoop, Houston, we show you close to Gimbal Lock. Yeah, okay, something went wild there on that station. And we're all set. We didn't lock it. We're going to head to the auto maneuver. Roger. Apparently they had some problem in uh, in the separation stage. I don't know. Let's put my eggs in inertia, uh, in inertia, though, to verify that we're at the right attitude, babe. Huh? Okay, just so it's in inertia. Okay, because in case we have to go to it, that's what we want. Let's get that egg. Wait a minute. Gotta get this damn thing. Charlie, how was the stage? Good, huh? 
surface. That's not child play. Okay, that's good. Got a lot of time. Seven minutes. Well, I, I don't know what the hell that was, Dave. That's new that's Houston, you're looking okay for the instruction You seem to be all right now. Yeah, Roger. Uh, that was something we've never seen before. It was real good. We went to Ike and... Uh, the computer's yours, Tom. Uh, I went through P-30. Going to P-40. Apparently, when they separated from the descent stage, they got uh, some gyration in the ascent stage where they're riding so the lunar module. I'll tell you what happened there real quick as they come around with a push and burn. Now, with their attitude, that they had started fluffing out, the thing just took off on us. Uh, Roger, we copy. I can see we're coming up. And we come up to inspection, so I put. I got a hold of it and tried to avoid gimbal lock, and guess I did. Looks like we got a good insertion out of it anyway. And, uh, made a good staging out of it, and we're all set to go for insertion here. Okay, Tom, call 686. Well, you could hear the tension in those pilots' voices as they were making those readouts. Stafford obviously was terribly busy. He couldn't okay, even... Okay, the computer's yours. There were no comments from Stafford throughout that operation. We were hearing only from Cernan, who as a good test pilot was reading out, uh, as he should have, as the lunar module pilot, the readings. What, we're going uh, back, we're that's where we want to go. Well, Stafford obviously... Yeah, okay, there was a moment there, Tom. Well, let's worry about it after we make this burn. I want to make sure the axe is up for it. Stabilize, okay. stabilize the spacecraft apparently, but of course they're not out of the woods yet. Five minutes to the burn. Mark, five minutes to the burn, over. The burn is the firing of the ascent okay, proposal Charlie, system. Okay, Charlie, we're with you. I think we got all our marbles. <laughs> I think we got all our marbles. In other words, Tom Stafford thinks that they're in good shape again. Fish, you're coming down to that ground, I'll tell you. I, I don't know, but I hope we never find it again. <laughs> they must be talking of the ascent stage, which they have now lost. And I tell you, that was wild, babe, and it wasn't the dab because you weren't eggs. That was eggs. Yeah, why did that then? We're, that's where we're going to stage. Okay, babe, I've got good eggs, and everything's looking good. i got the attitude set, so if we have to switch, we'll be all right. Okay, 407 on monitor until the burn. We're at four minutes. Okay, four minutes. Well, that's hard to do with helmets closed on. Give me a monitor and answer pressure one and two. Let's take, let's take another look at it. That's looking good. Then just stop push buttons. All reset and abort board stage reset. Okay. Push buttons reset. Axe translation. Uh, I mean, uh, axe translation four jets. The SAGs they're talking about is a VORT guidance system. I'm not reading them, so if they don't make it, you got to tell me, huh? All right, they're down there. Looking good. Brown. Okay, Tom, it's uh, Charlie, if, if we got uh, less than 170 feet, if we got more than 170 feet per second to go, we're on RCS. Then we're RCS uh, max on 55 seconds, but we're going to go. If we go greater than 170, we're RC back, RCS back to, uh, to our pad Delta V. Okay, which is going to be right at P40 there. That's R is looking good. RCS is Reaction Control System. It's that system okay, of... And our pad LV is 220.9, so if we burn less than 170 feet per second, or if we, uh, we don't get up to 170 feet per second ago, we'll want to burn it back to about, about uh, 220. Okay? Let's get over 100, let's get in at 170 feet per second region. Okay, push your inverter number one close, circuit breaker. It's about two minutes yeah, now into the firing of that engine. Reaction control, AELD closed. Reaction well, control we system is... We've got them again, going backwards, you know that? Look at that reel. 
That's got to be, that's got to be probably Diamondback right there. Awful close to see that. Okay, babe, coming up on two minutes. With all of their problems, uh, they still... They're good observers. They're supposed to be on this scouting flight. They're taking a look at the ground as well. You can hear the breathlessness of these pilots, though. They're wearing their full space suits for these critical maneuvers. And it's not easy to work in them, as CERN indicated a moment ago. Okay, two minutes, babe. Give it a final trim. Time the engine fires. 15 seconds. feet per second, 220.9. 15 seconds, 48. Maybe let's make this one. This is the one that sends them back out away from the moon's surface, back up to the 69 mile altitude where they can rendezvous and dock again. And 35 with the seconds. After I'm done, engine arm, ascent, axe control, and auto dead band mirror. This 15 second burn will increase their speed 141 miles an hour. Both they and the uh, command module are. 8, 7, 6, 5, 99, 3, 2, 1, burn. To go. This is a simulation. You're burning. To go. You're burning. 100 to go. 78 to go. 50 to go. 20 to go. Stand by, Tom. Okay, I'll know them out. Oh, beautiful. Beautiful. Charlie <laughs> Brown, uh, Houston, he got the burn off. We're in good shape. Oh, boy. Absolutely. Okay. okay. Congratulations to the study. Minus point three, plus point one. been some rocky ride they had there for a while. They're now, according to their computer aboard, in a 53.7 by 12.6 can you hear that? Uh, hear talking orbit. with a PT down here, over. Which is just about where yeah, they're supposed to be. I thought all of a sudden that was, uh, that was great. 
Okay, when they start talking, I'll key down here and relay through you, over. So you get them again. That's Houston speaking to Charlie yeah, Brown. Yeah, I mean, kind of. Right. Those communications presumably were being relayed to him, and he must have had some bad moments up there wondering if he was going to have to go through those maneuvers for which he's been training for two years to go down and try to pick them up uh, from their 13-mile-high altitude. But now they are on the way back up to his altitude. They come up to uh, within 13... Uh, Brown, uh, Houston, uh, we recommend for your next maneuver you can load the DAP with a half a degree per second. We see point two now, over. They'll come up to within uh, right, about 15 okay. miles below him, okay. below the command module, and then begin the series of maneuvers uh, to actually rendezvous and dock with him. Their next uh, firing of the engines is at 9.32 Eastern Daylight Time. Uh, that's uh, an hour and 44 minutes from now. Then there's some more maneuvers, and finally rendezvous at 10.54 and docking at 11.19. We'll come back in just a moment uh, to go out to Grumman Engineering Aircraft and find out uh, uh, just what might have happened out there in those very tense moments as they were just 13 miles above the lunar surface. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 10 will continue in a moment. The laser beam, darling of science fiction. Exotic laboratory toy until 1965, when engineers at Bell Labs and Western Electric became the first to put the laser on the job in industry. The job? Piercing holes in industrial diamonds to make thin telephone wire. Today, Western Electric uses the laser to cut material for thin film electronic circuits. We also use the laser to measure and to weld tiny parts for equipment we make for the Bell Telephone Network. Someday, the laser beam may transmit telephone calls and other data. Someday, you may find yourself talking over one. Western Electric. We make Bell telephones. We also helped change the laser beam from a toy to a tool. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 10 continues after this pause for station identification. This is CBS. Apollo 10 coverage is brought to you by Western Electric, manufacturing and supply unit of the Bell System, as part of our continuing coverage of important news events. Now here again is Walter Cronkite. At its 3,700 mile an hour orbital speed around the moon, the lunar module Snoopy with Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan aboard is now making its rather slow climb uh, up uh, by comparative speed, slow climb at any rate, up to the command module uh, for the rendezvous and docking a little later tonight. There were some close moments there, the precise details of which we do not know uh, as they swept within 13 and a half miles of the moon's surface. Uh, they apparently had some uh, uh, tumbling or at least uh, some disorientation right after they cut loose the uh, descent stage of their two-stage uh, lunar module. Perhaps our correspondent Nelson Benton and test astronaut Scott McLeod out at Grumman Aircraft in Bethpage, Long Island can tell us about it. Uh, Scott, Nelson, well, uh, from what you heard on that transmission, what happened? Well, Nell, uh, Walter, I'm afraid that unless I was there, I really couldn't say from the bits of information we got back here, I think it'd just be pure guesswork to try and estimate what had happened in the vehicle. Well, it, it, it did have se seem to have something to do with their attitude, mm -hmm. however, did it not? Well, I'm unsure whether it was their attitude or it could have been the eight ball here that was uh, tumbling or something else depending on how they switched from one computer to the other. I could explain 
with Nelson how they intended to make that burn, if that would help. Well, it might. Uh, they were talking considerably about uh, AGS, the abor abort guidance system, yes. which you might explain uh, to us and how that uh, is uh, plugged in at the uh, given moment. They uh, clearly were uh, uh, fighting the spacecraft in some fashion. Tom Stafford was so busy we didn't hear a word from him, and Cernan's uh, uh, brief communications were certainly uh, laconic. Well, the abort guidance systems that, that you were just speaking about is controlled from over in the corner there where Nelson is. I don't know whether you can see it or not, but the computer that does control it is very similar to this one that is the primary system. <clears throat> the burns that they do in the spacecraft, a uh, type burn like this, is done rather than using the throttle, which is behind me, and manually going through a burn, the information is inserted into the computer itself, either the primary guidance computer or the backup or abort guidance computer, and then the two astronauts, Gene doing most of the work to, for the insert, and Tom backing up in case there is a problem, and he must do it manually, stand by and wait for the burn to be done automatically. We don't know yet, I don't think, Walter, whether or not uh, uh, it was necessary for Tom Stafford to, to override the uh, abort guidance system uh, when that uh, gyration, I believe it was described as, when it occurred. Uh, it did occur, I think, right at staging, so uh, uh, that's that's what... That's the point in time that the problem is, but uh, I guess there will be some uh, head-scratching for some time to come as to exactly what happened. I imagine not only some head-scratching, but uh, I would think that uh, uh, until there is a very clear readout of what happened and uh, why it happened and uh, how it can be <clears throat> prevented from happening again, that uh, for the first time in the flight of Apollo 10, we see a possible constraint to the flight of Apollo 11. Uh, quite clearly, if there were wild gyrations of this uh, spacecraft uh, tonight, uh, there in that uh, very close proximity to the moon, uh, they, they can't tolerate this uh, again. It, uh, however severe it may be, it is far from the normal, and uh, there's going to have to be a great deal of consideration given to what happened tonight. Uh, Bruce Morton in Houston uh, has a report that, uh, on the work going on at the Manned Spacecraft Center during this flight to prepare for Apollo 11. Maybe, uh, Bruce, uh, you've heard something around there that uh, would indicate how seriously they take this problem. Well, Walter, they take it very seriously, and I think you hit the nail on the head when you said that uh, for the first time something's come up uh, which really could change the plans for Apollo 11. Uh, obviously, nobody here is sure yet what happened either, but uh, they are sure about what they want to do. They want to talk to the astronauts at considerable length, uh, both on the return trip and once they're back on the ground. And they want to monitor all of the uh, electronic data, the various uh, bits of tracking information that come down here. That's a process, as you know, Walter, that takes some time, uh, two or three weeks usually. So I think it's fair to say that the, the future of Apollo 11 as a moon landing mission is in doubt now. and. Uh, it's going to be some substantial period of time before we know, and, and indeed before the directors of this NASA program know which way it's going to go. Uh, this is the first thing like that that's happened. Up till now, it's been pretty much a textbook flight. Uh, they may have lost a few photographs, but the moon mappers say they have a lot of those anyway. This, for the first time, is a, a real serious worry. Uh, Bruce, uh, uh, it is true, of course, that when they blast off from the moon, uh, they're leaving the ascent stage behind on a stable platform on the moon. And if this, uh, if this was a malfunction tonight, it was directly connected with the separation from the ascent stage, uh, then uh, it may be considered when Houston begins to assess all of the data and uh, gets the debriefing from these uh, astronauts that they will determine that the solid platform for the ascent stage uh, would uh, negate any such problems of, uh, of, of guidance of the lunar um, ascent stage itself. Well, that's a possibility, Walter, but the, you know, we're not sure yet. It, it could have been an attitude problem, and if it's uh, the attitude in the ascent stage, uh, 
then it seems to me they're in trouble because you've, uh, you're have you on the surface and you've really got to start going pretty well straight up. Uh, yeah, that's, that's right. the beginning of that. <laughs> right. I, I didn't mean to uh, suggest that uh, all was well because uh, they, they will have a stable platform, but it is uh, one of the considerations, I'm sure, that will be fed into the mix, as they say. I hope you're right. Thank you, Bruce. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 10 will continue in a moment. Houston's just messaged the uh, lunar module that they already have analyzed the problem uh, when they got that wild gyration at staging, and they believe it was because one of the switches in the lunar module was thrown into the wrong position, a remote control switch, it's called. If that uh, analysis proves to be correct, then uh, presumably all will be well uh, in the spacecraft, and there will be no more concern about that particular problem. We'll be back at 11 o'clock Eastern time for rendezvous and docking tonight. This is Walter Cronkite at the CBS News Space Center. This has been a CBS News special report. The Flight of Apollo 10. Brought to you by Western Electric, manufacturing and supply unit of the Bell System, as part of our continuing coverage of important news events. Next Apollo update at 11 tonight Eastern Time. If you like this video, please press the subscribe button to subscribe to this channel and also give it a thumbs up. You can also be notified when I post further videos on the anniversary of this flight and on the anniversary of the flight of Apollo 11 coming up in July. You can also support this channel with a donation by using the link in the description.